Hello once again, this is The Debrief and I'm Angus Scott. When such huge footballing names as Neymar, Benzema, Conte, Mares and Mane, Firmino and Henderson all went to Saudi to join Cristiano Ronaldo, it seemed like there was a new footballing world order. With eight months, within eight months, the Saudis had splashed out around $850 million on new players, hived off world champions, Champions League and Premier League winners to adorn their pro league. But was that just the start? With a month to go until the January transfer window opens, we assess whether that was just the start of it, whether the massive outlay has been worth it, and what's next for the European top leagues who have lost a number of box office names to the kingdom? Remember, Fabrizio Romano will be with us very shortly to give us the latest on the Saudi project, news of a possible Victor Osimhen move, Spurs search for a centre-back, and much more besides. Ben Jacobs, who has three second homes in Saudi, is with me as ever. <laughs> That's actually accurate, Damam Jeddah Riyadh. <laughs> That's right. You, it is. You know it better than Leicester, actually, I reckon, at the moment. You've been there that often. <laughs> I mean, nothing's going to beat Leicester for a bit of Indian food. But other than that, I think I do prefer the sunshine of Saudi. <laughs> there you are. And he's, uh, for those of you watching rather than listening, he is adorning his uh, Christmas jumper. It's good to see that out of the closet again. And joining us once more from the Middle East is journalist and broadcaster Chris McCarty, who's Seen close hand the league grow in 2023. Chris, great to have you back on board the debrief. Yeah, great to be back with you, Angus. I'm still waiting for one house, let alone three. <laughs> but I'm getting there one day soon, hopefully. Look, last time you were on, Chris, you said there was $7 billion in the pot to spend. So there's still plenty more available to develop the league. And are you expecting that to happen or to start happening more in January? It's a great question, Angus. It's been an interesting, you said it, eight months is a long time since we, we saw Saudi really come to the fore from an international perspective. I've been really fascinated to see the, the growth or lack thereof. It'll be interesting to get your boys' thoughts on what the league is like from a UK perspective in terms of its coverage. Certainly from a, a United Arab Emirates, where I'm based, I'm obviously based here in Dubai. The league started with a bang. Of course it did. Cristiano Ronaldo joining in January. Then came the big names, the Sadio Manis, etc. in the summer. But that hasn't really, in my opinion, hasn't really translated. I think we all forget a transfer window is nice. You know, journalists, broadcasters, we're all looking for stories to, you know, fill the column inches, fill the airwaves. Once the football starts... We've got the Premier League back on our screens. We've got La Liga, Serie A, Bundesliga. Of course, Harry Kane's move to Bayern Munich has certainly catapulted Bundesliga back into everyone's consciousness again. And in a lot of ways, I think the season starting in Saudi has actually had a bit of an adverse effect. You know, the transfers are done. The, the, the kind of soap opera, if you will, has been put to one side. So I'm really interested by what January will bring. We know Michael Eminello, formerly of Chelsea, formerly of Monaco, He's now tasked with this kind of transfer guru, if you will. It's his job to put forward names that could help kind of really build the, the profile and reputation of Saudi football. So I'm sure he's got ideas. I'm sure he does. I'm sure the Saudis will be busy. As to who they'll bring in, though, it's a big question mark. We know January traditionally is very difficult to bring the very best names. So I'm really intrigued as to who will be tempted, who will be enticed by a move to the kingdom at the start of the brand new year. Ben, they can't be quiet, though. Then they would lose momentum. There has to be some positive news coming out of Saudi, as far as they're concerned, that they can still attract these players, uh, transfer window in, transfer window out. Yeah, but there's a paradox in many ways, because if you're doing your job in football recruitment, not just in Saudi Arabia with this project, but even more broadly, then you need that period of peace and if you're constantly signing, 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 then it might create headlines, but it doesn't create stability. So a ambitious first summer window is perhaps not supposed to be followed up by a crazy January. And then again, they'll move the following summer and then we'll see another period of pause. And one reason for that is that there are foreign quotas. So once you filled them, you have a balancing act where you might need outgoings first. So I think that the star names are important, but they're not the be all and the end all. The young names are important. Developing Saudi talent is also a big aspect here. And as a consequence, we should look at the first summer 
of this project, at least publicly, as an anomaly. And it will always be followed up by stars. And there's actually exit clauses, to my knowledge, that allow not only the players to leave, but also the clubs to have a squad refresh. So when you sign a three-year contract, if they do want to chop and change because their quotas get full, it's actually very easy, legally speaking, for them to release certain star name players. And as a result, we're always going to see movement. But I do think it's important to stress that if Saudi Arabia continue to only sign and sign and sign, then by implication, that is transience. And if you have that constant merry-go-round, you get yourself in a position where you don't get stability. And the only way the league's going to achieve its ultimate aim, which is to break into the top 10 in the world, maybe even one day the top five in Europe, is to have some kind of stability. I still think we'll see a busyness, particularly in the summers, in the next few years. But I don't think that last summer is going to be an every window kind of occurrence. And if it was, then I think that would actually be bad news for the Saudi Pro League in terms of strategy. Strategy, yes, but uh, publicity, publicity, no. I, I think there's a difficult balance here. I think they've got to be on the front foot and keep uh, everyone aware that the Saudi Pro League has not gone away because after those transfers, as, as Chris was saying, it's all died down. We've got to get back to normality. But actually, what the Saudis want, as far as I understand it, is anything but normality. They want to shake up the system for as long as they can before they become that solid league that fits into the mold of uh, of every other league in the world albeit with some star names in it I, I i think there's a there is definitely a balance that they have got to um get right at the moment and if they go too quiet then i think the the luster of uh, of coming out to play in the saudi league will will diminish I completely agree with that. I think you make a very salient point there, Angus. I think there's two schools of thought here. There, there's the power brokers who, to your point, will want the publicity. And then there's those that are employing the likes of Carlo Nora, a man that I know well and Ben knows well from his time here at the United Arab Emirates, a man whose job it is, the CEO of the league, Michael Eminello. They might have different thought process. To come back to Ben's point, I actually think moving away from a plan here, I think a lot of it may come to, down to circumstance. I think you'll have a lot of clubs, a lot of agents who will be knocking on the door in January and they'll be saying, right, we've got a player that we don't want, whether if it's a club, an agent, I've got a player who perhaps wants to cash in at this juncture of his career. So I think it will be more happenstance than perhaps plan in January. You know, I look at someone like a Casemiro or Rafael Varane, both players linked with moves, Jim Radcliffe taking over at Manchester United, may, wait, may well they have a future, remains to be seen. So I think January will be one where I'm not necessarily sure it will be all that planned. To Ben's point, I think it's the summers where you'd look for the Saudi kind of machine, if you will, to really you know kick into gear. So I think January is fascinating as to you know exactly what will happen. I'm sure there will be one or two moves, to your point, Angus, because they need the publicity. They need to re-energise the league mm. after it's gone kind of quiet when the actual action has begun. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why the league goes a little bit quiet is just because at the moment it's not been built to be competitive between all of the teams, which is why Al Hilal, who are top at the moment, can play Al Hazam over the course of the last few days and they can steamroll them and win 9 0. And those kind of results may make headlines, but it's not ideal. When you actually look at the top of the league, it's a little bit tighter and more competitive. Al Hilal are the leaders. Al Nasser lost their first two games, but since then their form has been just as good as Al Hilal and they're only four points off the top. Al Ali, a bit of a disappointment because on paper they should be right up there, but they're only in third and they're already, I believe, nine points off the top. And then Al had the defending champions, haven't had a good season, which is why Nuno's gone and in's come Marcelo Gallardo, which is a fascinating appointment. And that will make headlines and in a different part of the world as well. Remember, this isn't only about Europe. It's not only about making headlines in England. It's not only about taking Premier League players. But I think that the league's challenge is that not only is there that mismatch at a football level at the moment anyway between the top few teams and the bottom of the table, and it's a small league, so it's a little bit more 
apparent. But I think in addition to that, you start the season and it's the worst time of year in terms of the climate. So a lot of these new players have come and they've struggled to settle in the first few months. They're kicking off at nine o'clock. It's been 30 to 35 degrees. And I know that players like Jordan Henderson, Jota, who's not had a good time at Al Itihad and has been largely frozen out, even Karim Benzema, have all found they've needed more games than they would if they were playing for a European side. And then in addition to that, Neymar has got injured and Ronaldo's flying but that's because again he joined the league a little bit earlier so it wouldn't surprise me if in the back half of the season we see a bit more of a raise in standard as players start to acclimatise and then we'll work out whether we're going to get a more exciting title race. Right now it's almost a league for social media. Ronaldo scores a screamer and it gets a lot of attention but is there that appetite outside of Saudi Arabia or the Middle East and North Africa to watch a 90-minute game. And that's the long-term aim. And the yeah. ambition in recruitment will always be faster than the ambition commercially, the ambition to gain a global audience and the ambition to improve your infrastructure because all of these things take a lot more time than just entering the race for Osam and entering the race for Mbappe and so on. So I think that's the mismatch and whereas you applaud the ambition of recruitment, the rest of it is bound to take more time to catch up. And the key, I think, Chris, is that the Saudi strategists need to be patient. And I think they are. And instead of getting frustrated that not everything is going to happen overnight, they need to stick to this long-term strategy because eventually, if they do, it will pay off. But if they react, if they keep making opportunistic signings, panic signings, if they change their approach because they're not getting this overnight consistent impact, then you suddenly reach a point where you're not being patient. And patience is the only way that this project, in my opinion anyway, is going to succeed. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and ultimately, you know, you look at it, what are we heading into 2024? This has all of a sudden become a 10-year project. It is, it's no secret, Saudi Arabia will host the 2034 World Cup. Australia have bowed out. They've said thank you, but no thanks. Over to you, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So to your point, Ben, I think there is a little bit of patience. Everything that I see and read and everything that I hear out of the Kingdom is that there are you know, some sensible people in some key positions. And, and by sensible, I mean individuals with a vision uh, and who want to see it through. So, yeah, essentially they've got 10 years to get this right. There will be incomings. There'll be outgoings as well. I'm, I'm not quite sure it'll be quite like the UE Pro League where we've seen a stockpiling of talent, contracts being ended, FIFA getting involved. It's been a bit messy at times over, certainly in this part of, of the Middle East. I think Saudi Yes, there are one or two players. To your point, Ben Jota has not hit the ground running. But in the main, the big names who did make the move, Alexander Mitrovic, I throw him in there, Sergei Milinkovic-Savic, Ruben Neves. You know, they've all done, by and large, they've done well, certainly from an Al-Hilal perspective. Sergei Milinkovic-Savic, Ruben Neves, Malcolm as well. I mean, my goodness, Al-Hilal. And they've got a competent manager in Jorge Jesus as well, the Portuguese. So, yeah, if you get it right, it just shows you can go a very long way in the Saudi Pro League. I, yeah, I, I'm I'm looking at what a difficult balance is this is, and uh, if I, if I'm a if I'm a PR man, I'm still thinking I've got to tickle this along. I, let's compare it to the the way that Live has started and slightly stalled, and now has obviously had to, had to find a merger. It, it it it's made an impression, which is, uh, you know, without sort of tarnishing everyone in the Middle East with the same brush, they do splash out money, make an impression. And then try for things to follow on afterwards, and it, and it's that. But the ability to sustain a league is far more difficult than to spend a load of cash, entice a load of players who are coming towards the end of their career, the majority of them, than it is to develop a bona fide league that is going to challenge world football. Yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, ultimately, uh, getting that structure off the pitch, Angus, that's what it comes down to, right? It's increasing the facilities. I won't name my source, but there's a well-told story in these parts about Jordan Henderson, who arrived with his wife and inside two days was a bit surprised, let's just put it like that, by the lack of facilities or at least the standard of facilities at, at al Fac within four days. Yeah, you heard that right. Within four days, state-of-the-art gym equipment was flown in 
especially at Jordan's request from the UK. And I am told I'll let you fact now have one of the best gymnasiums anywhere in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So they're, they're tapping in to, to the mindsets of these players that they brought in. They are learning from them as they go along as well. Because to your point, yes, you can spend all this money on big name players. But I think coming back to it and, and the goal now with 2034 in mind is the stadia the facilities, the look and feel, the training grounds. Huge investment is going into the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, whether it comes to infrastructure, whether it comes to the big names, as well as the facilities. Rome wasn't built in a day, but I can assure you a lot of the big clubs are putting provisions in place where they will be the envy of world football clubs, the Manchester Uniteds of this world. I know Old Trafford, for goodness sake, is leaking. Carrington is falling behind. You know, there will be a time soon where Saudi football clubs, your Al-Halal, your Etihad's, they'll have facilities the envy of any club on the planet. Should they have, Ben, do you feel they should have had it before they signed in these big players? Look, if the Jordan Henderson story is is just one of, of probably many, when mm. they've come in and gone, hang on, the the the, the facilities we have here is uh, are not right. They're way behind the desire to have a a, a decent league. Yeah, you know better than most, Angus. Sometimes in the Middle East, the thought and thus the finances goes to the bigger picture and the glamour. So they'll spend a bunch of money meticulously arranging fireworks or a light show for Neymar's unveiling, but they'll forget to bring in a bike or a rowing machine, which is essential to the day-to-day, -day, or they won't invest or think to begin with about the dietary requirements of a player that's joined from the Premier League, but they'll happily build a brand new sports science facility or a state-of-the-art hospital. And that was the same in Doha as well, in the build-up to the World Cup. So it's no surprise that the really high-level stuff for sports athletes relating to science, relating to data, relating, for example, to injury recovery can be there. But at these individual clubs, they're not all the biggest. So Jordan Henderson joined al Ittifaq. They've just moved into a new stadium. But prior to that, they were playing somewhere relatively small. They were getting, even on a good day, under 10,000. And the whole club reflects that from the dining room to the gym to the training facilities. So I think on the one hand, yes, you're right that they could have looked at that. But sometimes these things take more time or sometimes the problem only becomes apparent after the star name arrives. So the counterpoint I'd say is in addition to what you suggest, which is should the clubs have built the infrastructure before starting this project? Well, yes, where possible, but it isn't always possible. But I think the other thing I'd say is the players need to do their due diligence as well, because if after four days, as Chris says, Jordan Henderson surprised, then great that they were able to rectify that. But Jordan Henderson, like any footballer, should not be surprised at what they are walking into. They should also do their due diligence. Yeah, you, you get a decent wage, though, and, and you're happy to overlook some things, aren't you, really? Um, yeah, but yeah. Henderson says he didn't join for the money. Of course, not yeah. many people believe him, but I think... Essentially, the key point in all of this is just, are the clubs going to fulfill a strategy? Because players can have more confidence regardless of what's there now if they know that there's the money there and also there's the plan there. And again, then they just have to be patient. I went to al Qadsia. Chris knows that club well. Robbie Fowler, I'd say farcically, lost his job when you consider that he hadn't lost a game in the league. But when I went post-match into the media centre when I visited them... It was also where the players were doing the warm down and there were exercise bikes that had been moved into that room and there was dunking donuts boxes for the players post-match. They weren't having donuts specifically, but it was the juice and it was snacks from dunking donuts. And you think, wait a minute, if this ambition is there to be top five, you've got a long way to go with your facilities, with your gym, with your media center, um, with your food, because we all love a donut, but there's not a footballer alive in the top five leagues in the world that will have one immediately after playing. So there is work to be done, but I think in fairness to the deal makers and the Ministry of Sport and the individual clubs, they're well aware of that. And I would imagine with the Club World Cup, with various... Asia-based football tournaments, and as Chris alluded to, the 2034 World Cup as well. All of this will be fixed relatively quickly. After that Dunkin' Donuts plug, Ben, I'm expecting them to be a sponsor next week on this yeah. podcast. <laughs> uh, let's hope so, because as, as non as non sportsmen, we're allowed to have them. Uh, definitely yes. after after the show, I think you you disappear to the green room. 
the virtual green room and have your Dunkin' Donut. Anyway, on, on that note, we'll take a little pause um, because uh, we are discussing will Saudi spend big in January? And a little bit earlier on, Ben caught up with our transfer guru, Fabrizio Romano, and asked him such a question. Fabrizio, good to see you. We're talking about Saudi and whether the Pro League might spend big in January. How busy do you think the clubs might be? I think it's not going to be as crazy as it was in the summer. So I don't expect super big names to move in, in January. It's going to be more about opportunities. This is what I think maybe players that are unhappy at their club could find the possibility to go to, to Saudi and be part of that project. I don't think super big names will move in the in the January window and the mission for, for Saudi clubs is going to be more more quiet for January and then stronger for the for the summer transfer window. So the clubs might not be too busy, but Al Hilal, who are top of the table, have obviously lost Neymar due to that ACL injury. Do you think they'll look for a replacement or just wait until he's fit again? I think they will look at some opportunities. I think that's a possibility. Al Hilal are always very attentive to, to the market, so I expect them to have some contacts in the next weeks to look at opportunities. At the moment, I'm not aware of anything close or, or advanced. So the feeling I'm getting is they're going to take some time. And again, we should keep an eye on players who are not so happy at their clubs. So that could be the solution for Ali Lales, as well as for other clubs who are looking at, at opportunities. But at the moment, it's not something uh, imminent. Again, obviously, they're waiting for Neymar in general. They really hope Neymar will feel better in the next months. They want him to, to be the face of their project for the future. And so for sure, they will wait for Neymar. But a short-term solution is something that they are considering for the January window. We hear a lot about Mo Salah, Kevin De Bruyne and Luka Modric. Are any of those three possible or likely in 2024? I think possible is, is yes, because, you know, the situation is very open there. So it's different kind of situations for Mo Salah, Liverpool, uh, as we know very well, they were fighting last summer to keep him at the club. So the expectation of the Saudis is to return for, uh, for Mo Salah and to try to tempt Liverpool again, I think, in the summer transfer window. Not in January. For Kevin De Bruyne, at the moment, the only focus is on recovery. So De Bruyne is not speaking to Saudi clubs. And at the moment, uh, the situation is, uh, is quiet. For Luka Modric, it's different. Luka Modric is out of contract in the summer. At the moment, his situation at Real Madrid is not the best situation. Obviously, Modric loves Real Madrid and respects the club, but at the same time, he's not playing uh, as much as he wants. And so that's why the possibility to leave the club in the summer transfer window is concrete, is something that we should keep an eye on. And so, for sure, Saudi could be a solution. They already made an incredible bid for him in June, and he decided to say no and to stay at Real Madrid. So I expect the Saudis to return for Luka Modric, but also maybe some MLS club could try to, to tempt him. Let's talk about Victor Osman. There was a new report in the Telegraph on Sunday suggesting that Chelsea might move in January. Do you still sense that a mid-season move is difficult or could Chelsea surprise us? I still, I'm still told the same on Napoli side. Napoli don't want to sell Victor Osiman in, uh, in January and their position remains that. Then uh, we know that in football everything can change with big money. But when I mention big money, I think it should be something close to 150 million euros. Uh, I don't see Napoli entertaining any negotiation for, uh, for less than this in the January window. And in general, they don't want to fix a price from what I'm told for January. So it's going to be very difficult. Then we know with big proposals, everything can change. But at the moment, I'm sure Osiman is on the list at Chelsea. I'm also sure that Arsenal are keeping an eye on the situation. But both clubs know very well that to go for him in January is going to be tough. And also that Aurelio De Laurentiis, Napoli president, is very strong in negotiations. When he says something, he's very serious and it's not easy. It was not even easy for Saudi clubs. Imagine that Halilal in August made crazy proposals for Osimhen and Napoli were not even replying with the price. They were just saying, no, the player is not for sale. So that's why I think in general it's going to be difficult. But it's also important to say that at the moment there is no agreement between Napoli and Osimhen to extend the contract. And so the situation is very dangerous for Napoli paying Osimhen on the contract in June 2025. You mentioned Al Hilal and Osaman is on record speaking to Mikel John Obi and Chris McCarty saying he was actually quite tempted by that offer. Can we rule Saudi out in 2024 or might dealmakers return for Osaman? No, I would not rule that out, honestly, because it's the reality. Osaman, from what I heard, was more than tempted by this possibility. He was open to joining Saudi clubs. But then at the end, the club decided to keep him. And so Osimhen also accepted the, the solution to stay at Napoli and move maybe in summer 2024. So I would not rule Saudi out. 
the priority from what I'm hearing is still Europe. So the player is still dreaming of Premier League football. It's always been his biggest dream. And so that's why clubs like Chelsea, Arsenal are keeping an eye on the situation. But for the Saudis at the moment, it's not time to move because they're not going on it in November or December. But I think for the summer transfer window, this could be one to watch again. Let's talk about Spurs. They've lost three games in a row and the expectation is they're going to be looking for a centre-back in January. What more can you tell us? Yes, they're looking at a centre-back. That's the position they want to, to cover. Also, we have to see what happens with Eric Tyre. So, uh, whether he's going to leave uh, as a free agent in the summer or in the January transfer window. Uh, for example, a player they appreciate is Kelly. With Kelly from Barmouth, uh, already in the August uh, window, they were trying to approach Barmouth for him, including Dyer in the negotiation, but that was not possible. Now, Kelly is on top of the list of AC Milan. They're looking for a new centre-back and Kelly is one of the options they're considering. So, Let's see who's going to be the player they decide to, to go for. Also, they had a change in, in their board, obviously, with new people now in charge of transfers. This could change also the, the targets. But they're discussing internally. I think they will take some time because I see them going for an opportunity and not for a super uh, difficult deal, as we know, for, for important players in the January window. is always complicated. So they will look for something maybe on loan with an option to buy that kind of deal. And so they will explore the market and let's see what kind of opportunities there will be. Spurs, like many others, have been linked as well with Gonzalo Inacio. Where do you see him ending up? Not sure that he's going to move in January because it's going to be difficult with Sporting to let him go in the January window. Also, he has a release close and it's an expensive one. Uh, if I remember well, it's something close to uh, 60 million euros. So it's going to be a complicated one. And I think it's one for the summer. So at the moment for Tottenham, it's not a priority to go there and spend 60 or 50 millions on a, on a centre-back in the January window. Also because Nicky van der Ven will be back in, uh, in January. So at the moment, Gonzalo Inacio is considered one of many players being scouted. But it's the same with Liverpool and it's the same with May United. Many clubs are keeping an eye on him because he's left-footed and it's very difficult to find quality left-footed centre-backs around the market. Yeah, it certainly is. And Postecoglou at the weekend also said that he's got no plans to sell... Giovanni Lo Celso, but could Barcelona still try? Barcelona really appreciate Lo Celso, and especially Xavi, from what I'm told. Xavi is a big fan of Lo Celso, and he believes he's an underrated player. So that's why he was already in Barcelona list in the summer transfer window, but Tottenham said no. And I think it's going to be the same for January. He's a player they appreciate, but for Barca, the only way is a loan deal. And for Tottenham, it makes no sense to send a player on loan when they have some players going to the AFCON, like Bisuma, Papesar, many injuries. Um, so I don't think they're going to risk and give the player on, on loan and then they have a problem in the midfield. So my feeling is that for Lo Celso is going to be very difficult to move in January again. Let's talk about Arsenal and their potential pursuit of Douglas Luis. You're on record as saying that he's one of their top targets, but Unai Emery kind of shut down talk at the weekend surrounding an exit. How do you see this one playing out? I think it's going to be a tough one. It reminds me of the Caicedo situation last January transfer window when Arsenal really wanted Caicedo. They made multiple bids to, to sign him and then at the end it was, uh, it was not possible. Now, it's similar because Aston Villa want to keep the player. Aston Villa are doing wonderful and also they consider Douglas Lewis a very expensive midfielder because he's doing, he's doing great. So I don't think it's going to be easy but I can guarantee that Douglas Lewis is on top of the list for Edu and Arsenal manager Teta. Both of them really appreciate the player and they believe that Douglas Lewis could be perfect for Arsenal midfield. But again, this is going to be very expensive, very difficult. And Aston Villa have no intention to sell. So I think also with the financial fair play stories that we know are going to be very important for Arsenal in 2024, I think this could be a complicated one. But he remains the top target. And a final word for Fabrizio on Maro Akadi. 16 goals for Galatasaray already this season. Uh, any clubs genuinely looking at the 30-year-old? Look, at the moment, from what I'm hearing, the links with Real Madrid are not correct in the sense that Real Madrid are not planning for a January move for any player, so there is nothing with Mauro Icardi. For sure, many clubs appreciate what Icardi is doing in Galatasaray, scoring goals, showing his leadership. It looks like the Icardi we saw here where I am based in Milano for many years at Inter, so finally back at this level. But at the same time, at the moment, I'm not aware of any concrete negotiation. I think it could be one to watch in January, but at the moment, I'm told that there is nothing really concrete with any club and he's not going to Real Madrid. Great stuff. Fabrizio, congratulations as well on being nominated at the Globe Soccer Awards for Best Thank Digital you. Journalist as well. You've certainly got our vote and we look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you. Thank you and see you soon. Ciao. He gets an award a week or nominated <laughs> for an award a week. 
I mean, he's he is that prolific and we're very grateful for him to uh, come on the debrief every week. But picking up on something that he said and, and that Ben mentioned, Chris, you had that conversation with Victor Ossiman. What I, specifically I, did he say about uh, it, what, elaborate on, on his thoughts of that he would go or was very tempted to go to Saudi. Yeah, I think the, the key line out of that interview was the more he said no, the bigger the offer <laughs> in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So in that thinking, if he just keeps saying no, maybe by 2026, he'll be able to buy Ben's three houses in Saudi Arabia. But <laughs> in seriousness, I think, uh, I think Fabrizio summed it up perfectly. I think he made no secret on that podcast with, with John Obi, Mikel and myself that, you know, the Premier League was the league that he was brought up with. He wouldn't really answer. He wouldn't be clear on who he supported as a boy was at Chelsea or Man United he said he had, he had shirts of both but I think the Premier League undoubtedly holds sway for Victor but as we've seen and as Fabrizio rightly pointed out he wouldn't rule out a move to Saudi Arabia if they come back again if they add a couple more zeros onto the end of that check then you just never never know so you know Victor made it pretty clear that he's happy at Napoli and with Fabrizio I do not see a January move if any big name striker that's scoring goals right now moves in January I think it's Mauro Icardi it's interesting to hear Fabrizio talk about him he didn't link him to Saudi I think he would certainly interest one or two Saudi sides I think for Victor he'll go through until the summer he said it without saying it I think his love affair with Napoli is slowly coming to an end End. I would expect him to be on the move next summer, but if I had to be pushed, I'd say he's more likely to head for the Premier League with Chelsea or Arsenal than he is to Saudi Arabia at this age. Yeah, and Ben, your understanding would be that, that he's probably Chelsea's number one target. Would that be correct? I think Chelsea want an elite striker. I'm told there's a bit more division as far as the recruitment team are concerned surrounding Ivan Tony, but also Chelsea don't want to rush if they are to push for Osman in January, even though it doesn't appear too feasible, it will be more to jump ahead of the market. So we could even see a scenario where, as with Christopher and Kunku, they try and agree something, uh, a price that suits De Laurentiis, and he's not an easy person to negotiate with, in order to jump ahead of other clubs. But it's a fascinating and complicated negotiation because Chelsea are 10th in the Premier League. Osman, if he pre-agreed anything or if he joined Chelsea, for example, in January, wouldn't know what he was getting. And I still think that he wants to play Champions League football. And if he was to go mid-season, he would be leaving were it Chelsea for no European football when Napoli are odds on to get out of their Champions League group. They're comfortably going to get out of the group, it looks like, anyway, barring unforeseen circumstances. So I think, as Chris said, Osman will see out the season, regardless of what Chelsea may or may not want. And the thing also about Chelsea is that Christopher Nkunku is on the verge of coming back. That makes a big difference. And if he chips in, as is expected with goals, Nicholas Jackson is starting to find a little bit of scoring form and Amanda Broya is still there as well. So Chelsea could be in a scenario where by the time they hit January the 1st, they're a lot happier about just sticking until the end of the season rather than rushing into a transfer. I think with Osman, if it comes to the summer and he hasn't signed anything with Napoli and Chelsea come in and potentially Arsenal as well, it's going to be a mad race and Osman's going to have many different options. With Manchester United, it's harder because of financial fair play, even with Jim Ratcliffe coming in and hoping to invest in the club. They signed Rasmus Hoyland. But interestingly, Manchester United nearly got Osman before he joined Napoli when he was still at Lille. And he spoke to another good friend of his, not just Mikel John Obi, who he's close with and speaks to, but Igalo. And Igalo was at Manchester United and the feeling from Osaman and those close to him was that he wasn't going to get enough game time to develop at Old Trafford. Flash forwards, that's a great decision because he's won the Scudetto with Napoli. He was on fire last season. He was eighth in the recent Ballon d'Or. So now he can pick and choose. And I think when you can pick and choose and when you know there's no shortage of suitors, he doesn't need to rush which is, again, why I think it's going to be very difficult because you've got Napoli who don't want to sell mid-season and have the advantage of being in the Champions League. You've got Osman who doesn't want to rush and ultimately destabilise himself and go somewhere before he's got 
a real full chance to assess his options. And that will all come in the summer, which is why I would be surprised if Osaman ends up moving mid-season. And therefore, if Chelsea want to wait, he does become their number one target for summer 2024. If Chelsea want to be aggressive like they were with Enzo Fernandez and try and do something insane in January... Of course, you can never say never, but it's going to require not 100 million, not 105 million, not 110 million, but maybe somewhere closer to 130 to 150 million to even make De Laurentiis consider it at that point in the season. So this is not an easy negotiation, but I do expect Chelsea to be there. And I agree with Chris that I think Osman wants to move to the Premier League, regardless of what Saudi Arabia may or may not offer in the future. OK, well, let's think about what, what Saudi Arabia does offer in the future then, Chris. Let's, let's throw it forward to, to next year. If I said Salah, Casemiro, Varane, Modric all ended up somewhere in Saudi Arabia next summer, do you think that Saudi would have succeeded and yes. kept the headlines going? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would say to you, Angus, you could ditch the other three. You could ditch Casemiro, Varane and Modric if they were to land Mohamed Salah. I mean, that is the game changer. You know, I, I did feel they got all so close to landing him last summer. The, the, the kind of, as the old cliche goes, the goal post could change. Who knows what Liverpool do this season? Liverpool could, and they will, I think, mount a serious title challenge. They could win the Europa League and they might, decide to stick with Mo Salah. Ultimately, the Saudis will be back. Mo Salah is the number one added player on the planet by a, by a distance, let's be frank. And he really does move the needle. Uh, I mean, if his move to Saudi Arabia, he'll be 32 next birthday, I believe. So he's still in his pomp. You know, he's still producing it. I know he doesn't get as many headlines as he perhaps did a couple of seasons back, but look at his numbers this season. Mo Salah is still a force to be reckoned with. And if, and, and it's my belief that Liverpool will be tempted. They, they run a proper business there. And, and yes, while he's still amongst the goals, he is getting towards the Indian summer of his career. And if a monster bid of 100 million plus came in, uh, I think ultimately Mo Salah and his team, as well as Liverpool, I think the decision will be taken next summer to sell. So the interest from Saudi, I don't don't think will dissipate. I think there remains an interest. Of course, there does. What that does for the league, bringing the number one added player to it. Uh, the other three, I actually think Rafael Varane is the most likely of the four. In truth, you know, there's there's something that's gone on behind the scenes with Eric Ten Hag. The fact that you know Luke Shaw has come back and is now fit. We all know that Eric Ten Hag likes him as a central defensive option. If and, and when he needs him, Harry Maguire seems to be now back in favour. Victor Lindelof, I thought was excellent against. Eric Everton. So Rafael Varane for me is the one, maybe more so than Casemiro in January for a move. And going back to what Fabrizio said, it's my understanding Luka Modric would prefer a move to the MLS than he would Saudi Arabia. So of those four you mentioned, I think two by the end of the summer, I think Casemiro and Varane, two and a half will throw Salah a half and Modric, Saudi, it doesn't really fit for me. So I think you're looking at two or three of those four by the end of next summer. Ben, your understanding on the Mo Salah one, is that their top priority for this summer to make that marquee signing? Yeah, I think when we say they, we have to distinguish between the Ministry of Sport, Michael Eminello, and to an extent, PIF decision makers that input across all of the clubs versus individual clubs and their needs because Salah's a priority for the Saudi Pro League, but obviously... Whichever club gets Salah, the other ones will have different names on their list. And an example of that is when Aliti had tried for Mo Salah towards the back end of the last window. They got the priority because they're the defending champions and they're in the Club World Cup. But Al Hilal also had Salah on their list. He was just number three. It went Messi one, they didn't get him. Neymar two, they got him. And had they not moved for Neymar, Salah was third on their list. So this is an interesting and key point because... People will assume it's another move for Salah and it's again Al Itihad. And that might be the case, but it could also be Al Hilal. The club can change, especially if we're considering the summer period where we will know who is participating in the Asian Champions League from Saudi Arabia. We'll know who are the defending champions. Priorities change, budgets change, and the overarching deal makers will be prepared to put Salah in the most strategic place possible. And that's why there's no guarantees that it will be Al-Itihad. It might, 
but we shouldn't assume it will be the case. I think that Al Hilal could be up there as well, but there will be another push for Mo Salah. And I think that he is just about the top priority. You could argue KDB as well is another one. And I think that Modric is a long-standing priority, but I don't think KDB or Modric, despite what they've done, despite what they've won, would have the same impact as Salah because of the Egypt links, because of his affinity in that part of the world. I think KDB is star power. I think that Modric is a coup, even at his age, but I think Salah is a poster boy for the league. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think that just continues everything. If you, if you get Ronaldo, then you get Neymar, and then you get Salah, you've you've made a, a very positive noise in the in the world of um, football, and you cannot ignore that. And that uh, you know that's that's a PR comms dream, isn't it? Really, if if you get there, and I just um, finally, Chris, I would sort of wrap this up that. Uh, where you feel we'll probably be having this conversation this time next year. And you asked us uh, initially, you know, how much impact the, the league had had in sort of television uh, terms since the window had closed. And I'd say that's probably minimal that, that not, and, and Ben says it's, it's a social media phenomenon, not a sort of TV phenomenon. People just want to pick out the good bits. They don't necessarily want to watch 90 minutes of Saudi pro league football maybe to watch Neymar when he's fit, maybe to watch Ronaldo potentially, but otherwise no. So I wondered what, if in 12 years time we will be discussing this, there'll be more people wanting to watch that league um, or, or, or you know, what, what it might be like for you in, in Dubai, whether it is spilling over a, a little bit more, because yeah. I'm not sure that we can say that's happened in the UK at all. And, and I would agree with it here. I, I think Ben is absolutely spot on. It's how I've kind of read the situation. It is social media moments. If Ronaldo scores a free kick, a header scores a hat trick, if Sadio Mane does likewise, if Alexander Mitrovic scores a great header, it is those little moments. And I think Ben is absolutely spot on. And that is the case here that, I'm not sure there is the groundswell of people sitting and watching 90 minutes. And I know for a fact the leadership over in Saudi Arabia are aware of this too, by the way. And it comes back to what Ben said. They are a patient bunch to a point. They know that this is a marathon, not a sprint. I think the investment will continue. I said it on the last time I was on the podcast. They have ring-fenced billions to get this right. And, and Angus and Ben, you both, of course, lived in Qatar. You know better than most. When Qatar won the World Cup bid, that's you committed. You can't go anywhere with your wavering belief that you've got a product, you've got to, you know, blinkers on, full pelt ahead for 2022. And if Saudi Arabia win this World Cup bid, and they're going to, the cat is out the bag. They will host the 2034 World Cup. That is them in a lot of ways. That's them straight jacketed in to ensuring that the Saudi Pro League is a success. So the investment will at least then be confirmed through until 2034. So you can bet your life, whether it's big name players, whether it's infrastructure off the pitch, Saudi are here to stay. They have got big ambitions. Ben said at the start of this podcast, top 10. They want to be top five. By 2034, they want to elbow Liga A out of that top five. They want to be up there with the Premier League's La Liga, Serie A Bundesliga, and they want the Saudi Pro League to be number five. From what we've seen, they've done a lot of things right. It's just building up that interest. And you've got to do that by continuing to make a splash, continue to bring the big names in and hope then that there's a tipping point that people do start to tune in far more than what I think they currently are. Ben, I, I suppose you were the one who brought it up and I, I'd throw to you finally. Is, is a sort of social media format league enough for the Saudis? Are they getting enough? Uh, that that's the way forward. It's it's the futuristic way. You don't need people watching for ninety minutes. You just need them to engage with the social media and the hits that that come out of it. I think it's a starting point for exposure and trying to get people to develop a second team in Saudi Arabia. Of course, there's almost a dual strategy in place. There's the so-called Vision Twenty Thirty, 
which is about improving lifestyle in Saudi Arabia, which is about not relying on oil and gas, um, which is about bringing sports to Saudi Arabia. So they get a big tick there as far as their actual physical audience are in Saudi Arabia. And then the social media is for your global audience. But like any top league, whether top 10 or top five or the top one, like the Premier League, you need that global audience to grow and get a return on investment. So if it is only social media and people are not watching it on linear TV, they're not flying over for sports tourism trips, they're not buying shirts and merchandise, then it becomes harder over time to keep the buzz going. And obviously the return on investment is not going to come only through people watching 15 seconds of a Cristiano Ronaldo goal. And also, of course, if Ronaldo leaves or the few big star names that can bring millions of followers overnight, then that player departing will take the fan base with them, which means that the social media numbers may actually diminish over time. Because yes, you can sign a Ronaldo or a Mo Salah, but there's a bunch of other players from the 94 that they brought in that don't quite bring that kind of following. And I think there's only maybe 10 players in the world that can add millions to your followers overnight. And Saudi Arabia are fortunate because they've got Ronaldo, they've got Benzema, but I wouldn't even put, for example, N'Golo Kante into that category. Yes, he may bring thousands, but not to the point where it makes a big difference. So I suppose in answer to your question, it all just depends on what the definition of a return on investment is. Because for a traditional league, return on investment is money through television rights, it's money through sponsorship, it's followers, and you can get data and you can market towards those followers. But for Saudi Arabia, they'll be spending a massive amount of money and they won't get that back overnight. They may never get that money back. But some of the return on investment is also about optics. It's also about headlines. It's also about impact on social media. And it's also about kind of non-tangible things whereby you place value on the fact that there may be secondary benefit through tourism. There may be secondary benefit through infrastructure gains that ultimately help you when you host the World Cup in 2034. And there may be other sports that connect into all of this. So we shouldn't just look at the Saudi Pro League as to whether it's working or not working in the context of football. We should be looking at it in the context of live golf, in the context of boxing, in the context of Riyadh season, which sort of sits on the intersect of lots of different genres like sport and entertainment. And if it does all tie together, then maybe the Saudis would argue that sport is a leading part of it but not the only part. And therefore, within the puzzle, if it connects with all of these other things in sport and outside of sport, there's another return on investment. So I think it's not going to happen overnight. And it is a bit underwhelming regarding attendances and those that are engaging globally in 90-minute games. But we've also only had one window and half a season. So in the same way the deal makers need to be patient, I think we need to be patient as to how quickly we judge it. Because I see a lot of headlines from outside of Saudi that just deride an attendance or deride a scoreline because there's a mismatch. And, you know, I don't mean to offend Chris McCarty as a proud Scot, but we don't do the same when Rangers hammer somebody in the SPL. Uh, we just say that's football, that's the Scottish Premier League. Rangers are much more powerful than a smaller minnow that they thrashed. So we have to be very careful not to kind of stereotype Saudi Arabia. We also have to be careful to factor in sports washing and put scrutiny on all of that side as well. But I, I do think if we're saying these deal makers are patient, then we as journalists and we as fans also need to be patient and reserve our judgment for at least a little bit longer. We'll do that then, Ben. We we will reserve judgment. Go on, Chris, what were you going to say? You, get, you need to come back after he's just I'm thrown that defend, at you. I've got to defend Scottish football here. That's what I've got to do, Angus. Man City <laughs> smashed teams at the Etihad more than Rangers and Celtic smashed teams at Parkhead and Ibrox, respectively. But that's a conversation for a different episode, I think. Yeah, you, you might be right, actually. Uh, a short episode, anyway. Um, <laughs> no. I joke now, but um, we lo we lost a great man uh, this week in Terry Venables, uh, a terrific player, coach and man to those who met him. Um, and from a personal perspective, he's given me more insight into the game of football than anyone else in my 30 years of broadcasting. Uh, every time I was in the studio with Terry, he was... Uh, just terrific company and so informative and so engaging. I would love to have been a player uh, playing under him. Um, and of course, he was in charge 
in Euro 96, that fantastic moment at Wembley. No, not when England beat uh, the Dutch 4-1. <laughs> Just left you for a moment there, Chris. But obviously when Gaza had it, Gaza had his wonderful moment. Absolutely. It was it was a fantastic moment. But uh, there are so many people who have come out in the last few days uh, that have said what great company and what a terrific man Terry was. We wanted to mention him as well. And also another name that we have recently mourned, who is Luca Viali. Um, but the memory of that Italian striker and former Chelsea manager lives on as they've named a new pitch in Turin after the great man. And Ben went to Italy for EA Sports for the naming. Two upgraded pitches have been dedicated in memory of the late Gianluca Viali to mark the launch of EA Sports' first FC Futures programme in Italy. The pitches are at the Spazio Talent Soccer Sports Centre in Turin, less than 10 minutes from Juventus' stadium. Viali joined Juventus from Sampdoria in 1992 and went on to win five major trophies, including Serie A, and the Champions League before moving to Chelsea where he'd win the FA Cup, League Cup and UEFA Cup Winners' Cup. Ciao, Viali's family joined around 35 kids for a special coaching session to mark the opening of the pitches which have Viali imagery behind the goals. It is a very emotional day for all uh, our family. Uh, Luca was um, a very important for us. Luca gave us a very big legacy, and so now we have to, to follow. EA Sports have worked closely with the Viali family, both on this project and in adding him to the new FC24 game as a so-called hero card. We've been really privileged to immortalise Gianluca Viali into the game this year for the first time, and we've seen millions of matches played with him through FC24. Chelsea fans, Juventus fans, being able to go back and hop into the game and, and uh, play with him in Ultimate Team is, has, been, has been brilliant and the reaction from the community has been absolutely incredible. But it was really important to us not just to, to celebrate Gianluca in the virtual world but also through this project today um, to be able to extend that legacy into the real one. So this was a really important project for us to celebrate the memory of Gianluca Viali, but also recognizing that the huge impact that he had on the, the clubs and the communities that he represented. And in the many discussions we've had with, with his family, uh, with the club, with the municipality of Turin, we recognize that this was a great project to be able to invest in that was gonna make a real long lasting impact. There are plenty of young footballers hoping to become the next Viali at the Spazio Talent Soccer Sports Centre, including the son of facility president Antonio Tucci. The eight-year-old striker is being watched closely by Juventus' academy. And EA Sports will also provide free weekly training to select players chosen by the municipality of Turin as part of their investment to grassroots sport. Luca Viali was much loved and is still sorely missed but his legacy lives on as he continues to inspire the next generation through both gaming and football. What a terrific player he was and what an impact he had on English football when he came over. Just a terrific guy uh, and anyone who was associated with Chelsea just loved him being there. And uh, we miss him and we will miss Terry Venables as well who died this week, a great man of English football. My thanks uh, to Chris McCarty. Thanks for joining us on the debrief again, Chris, and giving us your insight and what this uh, Saudi um, Pro League is all about and what the future might um, have in store. And it's a topic that we will no doubt return to many times as, as the league builds. So, Chris, uh, all the best to you. Thanks very much indeed. And um, enjoy, I was going to say, enjoy some rest, but there's so much going on in Dubai at the moment. You can't. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Busy. But thank you, Angus. Thank you, Ben. Always a pleasure to come on the debrief. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And yeah, you'll maybe be catching up with me back end of January. And who knows? Maybe exactly. just maybe there's a big game which landed in Saudi. There might be. It could be Ben Jacobs leading the league. Who knows with his uh, fourth palace. Anyway, <laughs> Ben, great to see you. Uh, keep that jumper on for another month and uh, <laughs> we will speak to you next week. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for listening. This has been The Debrief.